Alrighty, all of my phones now say six o'clock. So let's go ahead and get started today. Uh, so my name is Andrew Felton. I work with the Twalton Soil and Water Conservation District. And today I am joined by Laura Price. Hey, Laura, how are you? I'm good. Hi, everyone. It's, it looks like we have a pretty big uh, group tonight, which is always fun. And um, yeah, I'm good. I might have awesome. a cough or two because I've been over COVID a few weeks ago, but um, hopefully not. I have my ginger tea with me. Perfect. That's a perfect, perfect companion for a nice presentation for this evening, isn't it? Yes. Uh, so just a, just a quick, um, so as I mentioned, tonight's presentation will be on um, Naturescaping Basics or Introduction to Naturescaping. Um, just to go over a couple of housekeeping items before we get going. Um, as many of you heard, we are recording tonight's presentation, and we will be sending out that link to everyone that who, who has signed up. Um, so if you've signed up for the webinar, you will receive this recording, so don't feel like you have to take um, copious amounts of notes. Um, you will have a chance to review this, and if you are watching this recording, um, many of the things that we'll be referencing will be in the YouTube description below. Um, one of the things that we will be sending out to everyone who has signed up is a follow-up email. That email will have links to all of the resources that we discussed this evening, as well as a link to that recording. And I'll also include all of the slides as well. So, um, so you'll both have a recording as well as the slides that you'll be seeing tonight. So you will have all of that reference material um, readily available for you as you start your naturescaping project. Um, and one thing to note, one other housekeeping items to note, the very end of the presentation tonight, you will receive a prompt to take a survey. If you wouldn't mind just spending a, a minute or two and helping us fill that out, it is a huge help in helping us develop our naturescaping workshop series. Um, and it is a really great help for, for helping us put on these workshops in the future. Now, just to go over the, the format for this evening, um, I'm gonna be giving a brief introduction about um, my organization, the Twalton Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, we'll then um, go over to Laura for our presentation, which will go about an hour or so, uh, 50 minutes to an hour. And then at the very end, we'll have a chance um, for questions. The very bottom of your screen, you'll see two icons. One will be a chat function and one will be a Q&A function. If you want to put any of your questions in that Q&A function um, um, uh, panel, I'll be able to read those off to Laura at the, the very end. And we already received a few questions before the uh, presentation tonight as well that we'll have. Uh, great, Laura, would you mind um, sending me one slide over? Yes. Perfect. Uh, so as I mentioned, I work for the Twalton Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, we are one of 45 SWCDs in the state of Oregon. Um, what's really remarkable about soil and water conservation districts is that there's one for every county. So whether you're in Washington County or whether you're in, in Multnomah County or a county anywhere in the United States, you will have a conservation district um, base for you. Now, all of our conservation districts have a similar, um, similar goal. We work with residents in our community to implement environmental or natural resource conservation actions. So we work with farmers, we work with landowners or homeowners in urban areas. We work with folks who live in apartments. We work with community centers, you name it. We work to um, try and conserve our natural resources, natural resources like water, land, wildlife habitat, you name it. And we do that through a wide variety of ways. Uh, we do that through technical assistance. So we have specialists that can actually come out to um, many sites and walk sites, walk areas with you to talk about any natural resource issues you might be having and come up with creative solutions. Uh, we also have financial assistance programs so we can actually pay for many um, environmental enhancement projects on um, qualifying areas. And we also offer education programs like the one you're joining up with us today. So I always encourage folks that when you're joining our workshops, uh, whether you live in our area in Washington County or if you live in any other county, look up your conservation district because many of them have um, assistance programs that are available for you. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Laura. We'll, we'll oh. keep it short tonight. All so right. we'll, we'll hop right into naturescaping. Okay. Yep. This is a good slide to start with. Um, what is naturescaping? You know, this term has been with us for over 20 years now. Um, and it, it, it actually means there's a lot inherent in it and we'll get through all of the aspects of what naturescaping is. 
But I like to say that it's nature inspired. Um, it's design that really looks at and tries to mimic nature. And with that comes a lot of ecological um, benefits. And, and of course, we're most interested in our watersheds and our water quality. So, um, you know, that is why it's so important to the mission of a soil and water conservation districts to teach this. In essence, actually, I would say this is just a start or an aspect of it, but it's really beginning to incorporate native plants into your yard. And we say uh, the right native plants in the right place because you're trying to match the site conditions of your yard um, plants with the various site conditions, um, essentially their habitat where they'll be most happy and thrive. And when you, um, actually, I had a chance to read over all of your comments, and it was wonderful to see your list. Um, um, I mean, I saw a lot of the goals that you might have an interest for naturescaping, whether it's converting to more, your yard to more um, native plants, creating habitat, reducing water use, reducing maintenance, getting rid of your lawn. These all fit um, under the kind of the umbrella of a naturescaping approach. And here is kind of it in one slide in a nutshell um, that I think all of these principles or, or features are together make up a naturescape yard. So you can see the list and we're gonna kind of go through all of these, but just in one preface look here, we can see it's you know alternatives to lawn and grass. And I've seen some pretty stunning facts about grass and lawns, you know, they take up as much uh, acreage as say the state of Washington. Washington, And um, and the water that those lawns use in uh, here in the United States is much, is as much as all seven um, agricultural crops combined to give you an idea of how much water is being used and also how much area we have that's devoted to lawn that could be creating habitat and, pre and with that protecting biodiversity. So that simple step alone is a, a really, um, it's, a, it's a game changer. So we talked about incorporating native plants and we'll get into kind of the benefits of them. Uh, vegetation layering is another concept that you know, if you, I'm, I'm sure all of you um, spend time um, hiking in nature and, and you know what that feels like. And, and really there's many layers from overstory on down to um, ground covers. So we'll talk about that. Year round features, um, you know, thinking about it's a temporal, um, landscapes are temporal. They change um, in every month. And how do we get the most out of that, especially if we're thinking, of birds and uh, pollinators. Wildlife habitat, yes, it includes uh, food, um, but also water is essential for every living creature. And on top of that is shelter. And it's like, well, what is shelter for, say, a, a newt or different birds um, or shelter for insects? Where do they go in the wintertime? You know, there's a lot to think about when we think about habitat. Of course, water conservation, you know, we're um, in climate change and everybody's thinking about differently about what we can grow and how we grow our gardens to conserve water. And not, um, I shouldn't say not surprisingly, but um, really the, the place you start with almost everything is, is improving and protecting your soils. It's very uh, important uh, principle to me. And then um, rainwater solutions, because we have all this rain in the Northwest during um, at least half of our year. And so we don't want it to be cause damage. And in fact, we'd like to use it as, as a resource. So we'll talk about that. And then not last but not least, energy conservation. So let's get started here. So, um, replacing lawns with plant mixtures provide more environmental benefits and and I would say aesthetic as well. It's a shift. You know, it's a shift from our post-World uh, War II 
aesthetic that's very neat and sterile. And we've adapted that idea of a clean lawn that goes on and on, you know, from really it goes back to England and the, those um, estates where they had lots of acreage and lawn that was mowed by sheep. So here's a couple pictures. Oh, I see that I don't have the latest on that one, but um, this is on the left, you can see quite a large area of lawn that is, um, looks like it's in the front yard that's converted to meadow. And on the, on the, um, did I say the right, on the left, we have, this is a little lawn that's just been put in um, a parking strip. Um, so it can be done even on a very small scale where you can replace the lawn. Other alternatives to lawn and grasses, you can, um, we see on the left, uh, someone actually removed their lawn and has woolly thyme, a very low growing uh, ground cover. And the center is um, a wild strawberry. I think in this case, it's a beet strawberry, which is evergreen. So you're getting the flowers and berries in addition to a way to cover lawn uh, or cover the ground rather. And uh, again, on the right, we see someone's um, treatment of the park parking strip with a um, red creeping thyme. Uh, bottom left is, this is what um, one type of eco lawn. I think it looks like a floor to lawn mixture. So essentially there's still grasses, but they all have a mixture of maybe some microclovers. You see little English daisies here. And uh, when you get the leafy forbs mixed in with the grasses, they tend to have uh, deeper roots and stay green longer um, without water. And, um, and also if you have any kind of microclover mix with your grasses, they um, convert the nitrogen in the air into the soil. So it's actually feeding the soil and um, it, it still will be mowed but, um, and uh, watered, but a lot less often than a, a traditional lawn would be. And then of course, there's always the option of taking part of what uh, is your lawn area and, and uh, de dedicating it to growing food. Um, it, lawns do need to have a lot of sun and so do vegetable beds. So it's a good um, place to consider building some vegetable boxes and growing food. Okay, let's talk about some native plants. First of all, what you're seeing here is a nine bark, um, with that kind of pom-pom like flower, which will have berries later in the season. And why we like to um, plant native plants is for all of these reasons. First of all, they were here, you know, um, forever. <laughs> uh, they are adapted. That means they're adapted to our soils. Our soils tend to be, um, uh, you typically it's basalt bedrock and um, which might be a little more acidic as opposed to basic compared to the limestones that you might see in the Midwest. And also because of our climate with the winter rains, um, the um, calcium, the more basic elements seem to leach through the winter. So our soil is uh, naturally uh, a little bit on the acidic side. We tend to have in the Willamette Valley a very clay soil although it might be sandier the closer to the rivers that you get. So um, as I mentioned, it's adapted to our, our climate. Um, and there's not, there's a whole lot of plants in the ornamental nurseries that just aren't adapted to have eight months of rain and four months of hot and dry. So this becomes really I think one of their most important attributes for us, especially as we're getting more extreme seasons happening. And um, because they're adapted to all of this, they're, you know, and have been here forever, they're less susceptible to garden pests and diseases. And this, so they're, they're more resilient and uh, it just alleviates the need to deal with problems if you kind of have that right plant, right place, you know, site conditions. 
And perhaps most important of all is our plants and insects evolve together and they, and birds and butterflies and other species, they recognize our native plants and are drawn to them. So that's a very, um, what happens with all of the hybrids and ornamental varieties of things when you start um, breeding or hybridizing, you lose certain features and um, to gain other ones, you know, maybe you want a really a different color or a different size of plant, um, you know, what have you, you know, double, double petals on the uh, columbine. Um, but in, in a lot of those cases, you might be losing the, the um, actual value to the insect, which is its nectar and pollen. So you've heard us mention uh, right plant in the right place. And it just makes sense. Again, I think, you know, as you go out on your walks, you know, from, you will notice certain plants uh, kind of habiting this um, cohabiting, we call them plant communities, where you often see them growing together, which, you know, obvious reason is they like those conditions of shade or wetness or dry or sun. Um, so we like to, um, you know, focus or pay attention to that and follow that rule in our yards too. Um, even though it could be just a little yard that's 50 by 100, you do have microclimates. And that's one of the things we talk about in our site design class is really almost sort of a mapping where you get the most sun, where it's shade all the time, maybe where it's filtered light or um, morning or afternoon, all of those things are, um, it makes a little sun shade map for um, what plants would be happiest there. So most of these flowers that you see on the left would be, I think you'd naturally see in a meadow along with grasses that get a lot of sun. And that's a, a very um, attractive pollinator garden. And on the right, we're looking at the maidenhair fern and some hookara or corabels is another name. The stilby is this kind of white um, feathery flowers and a roadie I see. These are all uh, plants that are happy in a part shade situation. So, you know, this is not a class that, it's an overview, so we can't um, show you all the wonderful natives, but we're gonna show you just samples um, in a few categories. Again, it gets back to those layers that we mentioned. So these are ground covers. I think of plants that blanket the ground and um, we have on your left a redwood sorrel, looks like a clover. Center is a woodland strawberry, and on the right, the um, Oregon sedum. And we have a few kinds of native sedums, and actually a few kinds of native strawberries as well. Um, the, the sorrel would be happiest with some shade or part shade, and the other two are really good sunny ground covers. Uh, I try to, I really love this blanketing effect. It protects the soil beneath so it doesn't get compacted by all the winter rains. It actually creates a little microclimate itself when you have that density of plants. They can stay a little cooler and moister through the summer um, when they really need that. Uh, and they're just another uh, mini habitat for certain creatures that like to be on the ground. And then we come up a layer to kind of two to, you know, four feet high, maybe. And we have uh, some bleeding heart. Actually, the wild ginger, I would say, is um, closer to a ground cover. It might be about six inches in height. Here's a red columbine, which hummingbirds love. And on the right, camas, um, which was a very important plant to our Native Americans. They um, ate the bulbs of them. A starch. We have a lot of fruiting, flowering and fruiting natives in the shrub category. And, and I'm showing you just a brief sampling here. On the top, they're all deciduous. And on the bottom, we have evergreens. And I encourage you, you know, in your planting design and palettes to think of uh, trying to maintain a balance of having both. So you really 
have some structure and visual appeal in the winter as well as the summer when everything's um, blooming and busting out. Uh, so yes, you see a red osier dogwood, you can kind of, it's also commonly known as a red twig dogwood. You can kind of see it in the stems there. And um, it's a rather tall shrub. It can be up to um, 12 to 18 feet high, but it also prunes very easily. Red flowering currant is, um, it blooms very early in the spring, even before the leaves are all out. And uh, love this one because it's a magnet for the hummingbirds and there's not a lot blooming um, in the early spring yet. So that's a, I'd say it's a must um, have plant in your native landscape. And then the maca orange, it's very, very, um, perhaps the most fragrant of our native plants and, uh, and lovely. Down below, we see the evergreen huckleberry. It's a cousin of the blueberry. So the berries are pretty tasty, though very tiny. And uh, then we have a dull or Oregon grape. And again, we probably have three, we do have three species of native Oregon grape. It is our state flower. The tall Oregon grape is the this one that you see is you more typically see in shaded areas on the forest floor. In fact, I often see it as a companion in the woods with this sword fern that you see on the right. But the sword fern is just so resilient. It seems to be happy in a quite a wide array of microclimates in your yard. And then we get into trees and there's understory trees and overstory trees. So the vine maple, I'd consider an understory tree. It's, um, it's really very similar in habit to the Japanese maple. It's just our Northwest version and one that colors up really nicely as you can see, and it fits a small yard. So it's another really popular one to introduce to your yard if you don't already have it. In the center is a cascara tree, and it does get um, nice berries that the birds love. And it's about 30 feet high. And, and what's interesting about this is um, of the native trees, we have a lot of large ones and a lot of multi-trunked ones. And this one is a single trunk. It's actually on the Portland street tree list as an acceptable street tree. So that's a a good one to consider when you want to add some um, street trees in front of your home. And then on the right is the western red cedar. It's a conifer. It will get quite large, um, but it's really important to try to have a conifer in your yard. They are providing you the bird's winter shelter and, of course, a lot more life than the birds that maybe we don't see so much. Um, and if you don't have a yard large enough to accommodate some of our native conifers, which all get quite big, um, you know, that might be a reason you look at some other conifers that, you know, fit well with your environment, um, but aren't necessarily native. Okay, I mentioned the layering and um, you can see it. It's almost like you can, this picture I think illustrates that, that quite well. Um, um, you see different layers from plants that are growing right close to the ground to maybe knee high or waist high, some other tall, taller shrubs. Um, again, I think we can see the vine maple uh, there and um, don't see it, but I'm sure there's probably a tall, <laughs> tall tree behind that. And, you know, this, I think, really, when you talk about mimicking or being inspired by nature, I think this is one of the most important principles to try to create in your yard. I mean, that little path is really draws me to go, you know, follow it and see where it goes. And there's so much to notice um, when you do. And you, it really does, instead, in, you know, in addition to aesthetics, it is creating different habitats. And this is just another example where you can see the different layers and we have perennials, ground covers, ferns, uh, some taller shrubs, a smaller um, 
understory tree that will get quite bigger. And of course, this is Douglas fir here. And I think that is probably a dogwood on the other side of it. Oh, uh, okay. This is a example of um, some layering that, um, and the birds that, that occupy these different vertical layers of the trees and um, which just sort of illustrates the importance of that uh, layering effect. So when we talk about year round features, it's, um, you know, it is providing, it's trying to select a palette of plants that um, will give you blooms, and berries and or sea, you know, different food sources throughout the year um, provide that habitat throughout the year, aesthetic value. But when, and also when we talk about food sources, it's not just the, um, what shall I say, nectar and pollen, but it's also berries and it's also seeds and, and nuts and um, all of the things that these plants provide. So just a little sampling again, I mentioned, you know, upper left, you can see when we talk about uh, pollinators and blooms that that um, it's a close up of the uh, red flowering current. And um, as I said, it might uh, start to bloom in February. And contrasting that in the center, upper center, is the uh, Douglas Aster. And I've seen it bloom into November. So um, you know, when we get on to late summer and fall, it seems like the choices we have are, are far fewer than the ones in the spring and the early summer. So really pay attention to those long bloomers and late bloomers. And on the right, this is a, a, a rush, a spike rush. And this is something that if you have um, maybe where your downspouts go, or if you have a rain garden some or a low area that tends to be a little soggy or wet. This is a perfect plant for that. And the thing about these rushes, they are in the grass family, so they have a lot of seed heads. And some of them, um, you know, they're really attractive as well as a, as a feature. So we have to um, kind of expand our sense of aesthetics to fall and winter as well. Um, and it's a different kind of beauty. And as you can see down below, this is the a red twig dogwood that I showed you earlier, but we're seeing it in the winter time without any leaves. And it's quite um, stunning winter structure as well. Okay, so let's talk about wildlife habitat. You know, we always say food, water, and shelter. Um, you wanna be thinking about all three. By the way, this little flower cluster here is um, Douglas spirea. And in fact, anytime you see flowers that come in in a cluster of many little flowers, those are really key uh, attractors to pollinators. There's a lot there for them. And then um, we also wanna think about nesting opportunities. So, um, I've already mentioned this, but um, so for example, in this center slide, we're looking at Sedelsia. It's, it's a flower that's in the um, uh, hollyhock family. If you um, know or remember that, it's a very much an old fashioned flower called checker mallow. So it's tall stock. These can get up to four or five feet. And again, this, this uh, bumblebee is quite nicely rewarded. And they will, they probably are midsummer. Um, on the right, we're seeing some berries on a um, service berry or amelanchier, another one of our natives. Here's a hummingbird, um, not on a, a native, it's, this happens to be crocosmia. But any of you, the flowers that you see that are in that red, orange, pink spectrum and have a tubular nature to the flower, those are going to be very attractive to our hummingbirds. And we talk about water. And um, we're looking at a little simple bird bath here with some things in it, like shells or rocks. 
And the reason uh, you might put a few of those in your bird bath is that it's it's a little easier for bees to drink water. Um, you don't want them to be, and it, of course it depends on the style of your bird bath and the rim and all of that. It may not need it, but um, that's the reason we put some of these objects in there for them. So it's easier for them to land on something and lap the water. Down below at the base, you might notice there's a little bit of gravel there. And if that's wet, that is very appealing to uh, butterflies to come in and lap some moisture off of the sand or gravel. To the right, um, we're, uh, I imagine a lot of you know, this is a mason bee box. You know, in nature, they would be looking for cavities, but you can provide that for them. And, you know, there's there's a bit to learn about how you maintain them and clean them out. So, you know, they're there. Um, those holes are cleared and clean every year to invite the mason bee. But mason bees are great to bring to your yard because they're solo bees. Um, they don't have a stinger. They don't, um, therefore, they don't um, live in a hive like honeybees who need to protect their hive. Uh, mason bees, and they hatch much earlier in the year, so they can begin pollinating um, quite a, you know, few weeks before the honeybees, because honeybees are, um, they're from the uh, Mediterranean. They probably came over on some of the first ships, and they're not really active till it's quite warm. Oops, I think I... There we go. Okay, water conservation. Um, there's a lot of ways to conserve water and uh, save on your water bill. If you live in Portland, you know what I'm talking about. Um, you're seeing some watering methods here, but I want to say in my book, most important is what you do with the soil. If you're amending soil at mixing compost with it, um, that increases its water holding capacity. It also, um, if you think about it over the year, where, um, you know, the water drains better and it actually gets down deeper into the ground, even to the, the groundwater. And so by having that infiltration into your soils, um, it's going to give you some benefit longer, you know, into the summer season before you really feel the, the effects of the drying. So it increases drainage, it, um, but it holds, it has more water holding capacity and um, not to mention all the other benefits in terms of um, soil life that we depend on in the soil, the microbial life. And then in addition to mixing that um, organic material or compost in the soil, you wanna put a nice thick layer of mulch on top that sort of caps it. It's almost like frosting on a cake. And that uh, prevents weeds, which is, you know, prevents maintenance, but it also holds the moisture in really nicely. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, I visited um, a big garden, a uh, church had put in a garden that it, it's, a, it's a new practice, it's called dry mul mulch farming. And so they put 10 inches of arbor trips over the whole site and are gardening that, and I um, visited and they, them, and they uh, maintain that they do not, once they put the plants in and water the little starts in, they do not water all summer, which is quite amazing. And um, and they have a bountiful crop that the, uh, this was next to a church. So all the church members and the community and neighborhood benefit from it. It was quite inspiring. So that is just to attest to the value of that mulch on the ground. And of course it's breaking down and adding nutrients to the soil. It's actually building soil. And it, it turns to compost itself. And again, just that, you know, provides those nutrients, the good drainage and the water holding capacity. The other thing you can do, and it gets back to how we talked about, um, um, you know, plant companions, you group them that have similar water needs. 
and you know looking at your your yard if you do have some lawn that might um have watering you may water more often than you would say on the edges with the bigger shrubs that have deeper roots and the corners that you don't get to so plants if you do want to plant some of our perennials that are really happiest with um or when i say our i mean our native perennials um they're happiest with a little more moisture think of where you're placing them either you know next to you know the front of your bed next to the lawn where they're apt to get a little more moisture or near your patio where it's easier to provide that you know watering maintenance when you do water um you know what use the cool part of the day morning is best you know especially in our hot summer days where you want to give them that drink of water at the beginning of the day rather than the end when they've already um, suffered a bit. <laughs> um, and it reduces evaporation um, when you can get that water into the ground in the cool part. You know, I'm looking at this picture on the top and it looks like he's, this person is spraying the foliage, but really you just want to, you know, the, the leaves don't need it, the ground and the roots need it. And so whatever, you know, if you are using a hand wand, um, for a method of watering, just remember you're really watering the ground, not the, the leaves. And um, down at the bottom here, we see a couple um, drip irrigation systems. And that really is the most effective. You know, you might think it's not, which is the drip, 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 but that slow drip, drip, drip delivers it at a pace where it actually waters more deeply and it's not watering everywhere where you don't need to it really focuses where you're watering and um and it uh, so it's effective that way in terms of conserving how much you use and having the the best effect of your watering methods and next to on the bottom right you can see the main hose but there's little these little spaghetti um, tubes and emitters that you can plug into this um, larger uh, hose that you can kind of branch off of it and again put them where they um, need to get to um, you know the base of a shrub so you don't have so many big um, hoses laying on the ground and 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 it keeps it low to the ground. Um, I guess I failed to mention this upper right. That's, um, you maybe know it as a soaker hose and it kind of bleeds through. It's, um, sorry, jump there. It's effective, but not as effective as uh, the other methods that I found. But it is a, a slower method of, of watering close to the ground. Okay, um, I already did my little soapbox about improving and protecting the soil. And, um, what we, for a number of reasons, you're really trying to build a rich living microbial soil. Um, and that is gonna be the most benefit to your plants as well as good infiltration of water and water holding capacity through the summer. But also um, you wanna protect that soil with um, ground cover and plants with various root depths to hold it all together, especially if you're on a slope. So when we, um, you can see some examples here in this slide, you know, on the left, it, um, all of these um, planting beds have a nice, good layer of the darker uh, mulch. Maybe it's a more a half composted mulch, We've got wood chips in the paths um, that you're walking on. And in the center, I know some of you may had an interest in uh, removing lawn. This was a project I was involved with at a, a neighborhood park where we actually created um, about a quarter acre um, community garden. So it was a community project, used a lot of bark chips and a lot of fall leaves, probably stacked up uh, again, maybe 10, 10 inches. We used cardboard as a base layer, which was common practice um, for many, many years as um, that was seen as a barrier to basically kill the lawn underneath. And so it would decompose. But um, the latest research has showed that 
if you, um, it's not necessary, in fact, might um, be a little bit of a barrier to the process. And if you just stack it thick enough, it will um, be enough to um, kill the grasses underneath and have them decompose just as they would in a compost pile. And all of that mulch of leaves and bark chips on top uh, themselves are um, decomposing. So, you know, it looks <laughs> 10 inches sounds like a lot, but over a year's time, it it all decomposes down. In fact, I've added um, a layer of bark chips over my whole yard every year for the last three years because I really need to build soil in my yard. And, um, and I try not to have exposed soil because it's just an invitation for weeds to come in. And, you know, um, photo on the right is just a great example of um, leave it, leaving the leaves. They themselves are a mulch. Um, and, and you always want to cover the ground, especially in the wintertime, with something. And if not, the, the leaves or um, some mulch, um, you know, I've collected... I'm a big one for collecting bags of leaves or needles <laughs> to bring. I, I use it on the top of my garden beds as well to put them to bed. When I say garden beds, I mean my vegetable beds uh, to protect that soil through the winter time because the rain really does um, compact the soils. So it, it doesn't have that kind of fluffiness that you want it to have um, with pore space and water draining easily. Uh, so um, it really needs that protection. So we see a few examples here uh, on slopes. On the left, this is, it, it looks, well, what you're seeing mostly as a ground cover, again, is the um, uh, native strawberry. And it spreads really quickly, which is nice when you want to get something established. Within this, it's kind of hard to see, but we have, and this these were newly planted shrubs, so they're pretty small. We have one here, and it looks like we have a vine maple, or maybe, maybe that's a um, flowering currant, and um, um, what I want to say, uh, not an elderberry, but um, little evergreen um, berry. And so all of these shrubs are, will get big and fill the space. But in the meantime, you have this ground cover of um, um, strawberry that's protecting the ground. And on the right, you know, those other shrubs will have the deeper roots to protect that slope. And that too is what we see on the right with a, a variety of plants that assures that you have a variety of root depths to keep that soil from eroding. Of course, you can also build terraces and or incorporate rocks and, uh, or boulders into a side slope. This picture um, photo on the right, very steep. It looks steeper than 45 degrees even. Um, and so that uh, that is stacked boulders, but there's a lot of pockets in between them. And all of these plants are growing in the nooks and crannies and um, much, you know, it's kind of self-maintaining. I've actually saw before a slide of this that someone was trying to mow that steeple lawn, which I think is crazy. Um, so um, let's see, is there anything I'm missing about that? I think not. Oh, except that, you know, the other benefit of building the retaining walls, um, it gives you more usable space. You can see that there's a little patio back here and we have a more gentle kind of climbing path to that area up the hill rather than trying to go straight up the hill. So, you know, it might be worth your investment to do some terracing depending on what's, you know, what your site is and what you want to um, do with it. Okay, um, we talked about rainwater solutions. So we have all this rainfall and every drop that falls is going to um, run somewhere as surface runoff. So you want to think about where it's going 
and make sure you don't have any problems, first of all, like water running toward your foundation or water running down a slope that has no vegetation and is causing erosion. Um, so that's something to think about. And um, just to make a point here with all this rainfall that we have, I um, um, we see different examples of um, with the water cycle, like in a, the first one is, you know, in a natural kind of situation, you see how much water where the ground is covered and we have all this veg vegetation and probably a very thick, um, you know, leaves, sort of a duff layer, or infiltration layer. Um, we see 40%, 25% and 25, you know, draining and infiltration deep down into the soil and not very, very much runoff at all. And as you can see, when our human, you know, uses and development increases, we lose, um, we have less trees, that means less evaporation, um, less infiltration, and maybe some more impervious surface, and um, these ratios change. Until we, you know, that these percentages change until you get into an urban setting, and you could have 75 to, in some cases, 100% impervious surface and where does all that water go? Well, we know it goes into our catch, ba catch basins in the street, but we're trying to avoid that. We're really trying to get it into the ground. Um, so it has less impact on our municipal system or in a lot of cases, in some areas, we have um, culverts dumping directly into our streams, which has really impacted them um, tremendously. And lost a lot of the habitat value of those streams. So um, this is a very popular solution is to take the down, downspouts, seeing some little, little errors here to fix up, uh, of, uh, from our roof and direct that water to a place in your yard that can collect the water. So basically it's a very shallow little garden bed. Um, and in this picture on the right, uh, the we have pipes that are connected to the downspouts that feed the water into this, this basin, this rain garden basin. So during a rainfall event, it can fill up and hold the water and allow it to percolate more slowly down into the ground, where it otherwise might have, it might have just run off into the street. And here is another one on the right um, with a, a little more established, so you can see the variety of plants in it. And we, um, you know, in our plant lists, we we identify all of those ones that are um, really love this plants that you would see. In nature, near a stream, or in our wetlands, or maybe just um, low wet areas, would be happy in a rain garden because they do need to uh, be able to have um, have their roots infiltrated with water once in a while. And um, we talk about rainwater harvesting. Here's the thing about our climate here is we know we have all our water at one time and then no water for uh, four months. So, um, you know, the little rain barrel that we see so often, that's charming. It just doesn't cut it. You really need a bigger um, cistern or um, um, to collect this water so it can be of value through the summer. And you also wanna pay attention to your paths and surfaces and um, choose um, surfaces that are imp or that are more pervious. So on the upper left, you can see that two kinds of pavement there. These little pavers have, are designed with spaces so the water can drain through. And even this um, concrete that you're looking at, it's a pervious concrete, kind of like a rice cake that also allows water to come through. And a lot of people are, are kind of 
um, choosing to have a Hollywood driveway is a term we have call it, where it's like you only use as much concrete as you need. In this case, the water, the concrete is probably draining toward the center, established with established with some very low ground covers. And if you're really committed, um, you can uh, maybe find an opportunity to um, construct a little green roof that also um, is effective for um, holding the water, slowing it. So we don't have the the big flush of, of water that comes, uh, you know, the stormwater runoff that we're trying to minimize that wherever we can. And then we talk about energy conservation. And we can see a few examples here where, um, you know, in the summertime, you want to really place those trees where they're providing some shade for your house. So it, it doesn't, it, if it has air conditioning, uh, you don't need to use it as often, or it just makes your house more com comfortable to have it be shaded in the summertime, but it's still getting the su uh, sun it needs in the winter. And even in your yard, you want to create places to enjoy in the shade um, of a tree, because um, the summer direct sun can, can feel kind of harsh. And also, too, we can think of um, controlling the, the winds. You do have prevailing winds. Um, I used to notice all the east winds from the gorge. Now where I live, they seem to come from the southwest in the wintertime. So again, I'm thinking about where I put my trees to give a little more protection to my yard. And uh, you can see in this little diagram how, um, how wind currents um, flow with those trees or even a fence. So you have a more protected zone right next to it. We have a few examples here of before and afters. I love this. Um, here you see somebody um, using the sheet mulching method to remove uh, a portion of their lawn, or maybe it's in process. And it could use a um, much thicker layer of mulch there than it has, but this is a good start. And look at the transformation that they've made. Uh, so this was uh, this, you know, you rain gardens can be quite discreet. There is a rain garden in here and I can see some uh, wetland or plants that do well with the, the water around the rain garden and also in it. Um, so it's providing that benefit of collecting rainwater from the roof. It's removed the lawn in, in its place much more diverse array of plants. This is the uh, that um, Douglas Aster that I showed in the very beginning, blooming late in the season. Um, and of course, you always want to think about circulation. You know, paths help you enjoy your, you know, moving around your garden and also giving access to it to maintain. And, and, uh, and as I mentioned, there's a lot more wildlife benefit to this change as well. Here's another example, um, not a very um, pretty corner of the yard before uh, they did this. And you can see that we maybe have some views and fences they want to screen. This is newly installed. And so, you know, it sees, it, you kind of see the, the framework. Um, and notice, you know, they're trying to create a nice little retreat, uh, kind of cozy spot in the corner with this um, fire pit and a place to sit. And notice that, um, you know, this might look like a really wide path, but you want to, for your main paths, you want to think about how you move around and um, make them generous. And, and here is it, uh, a little while later, you can later, and you can see this ground cover in the front here. This is knick-knick and it's it's spreading uh, quite nicely. So you get a soft edge if you like um, that. And it's done some good screening here. I'm not sure what's going on with that tree in the back, but it looks like it could maybe use a evergreen shrub to um, add back there too. You always want to manage um, invasive plants. I noticed many of you have signed up for backyard habitat and 
that's one of the uh, first things they will look for is invasives in Tualatin um, soil and water district is is um, very helpful in um, they have a program that will help you identify and, and remove them. Twist defenders of habitat. And there's other resources. We have a, I apologize for this. I realize I have an older version of the, I thought we had the latest, um, but we do have a nature site design coming up um, real soon. I think in a couple of weeks, Andrew will um, confirm that with you. That gets into more detail of how you can begin to implement this in your yard. And these are some resources to learn more about the plants. Um, there's so many. And uh, we also um, invite you to join the Backyard Habitat certifi Certification Program. Um, there's just a, um, a lot of benefits to that. And you can see that they're really a good companion um, in helping um, achieve all your um, nature scaping goals. And the, contact, the ways to um, contact Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Laura. I so appreciate yeah. um, seeing that presentation. Um, so just uh, to hop on for the um, site design course. So our next site design course is on October the 28th. Unfortunately, it is full at this point, um, but we are taking names for our waiting list. And so I will, um, when I send out that follow-up email for folks, if you if you would like to be added to that waiting list, um, folks who are on the waiting list often are the first to hear when we schedule our spring um, workshops. And so we'll oftentimes um, offered the site design course both in the fall and in the spring. So um, just let me know in that follow-up email that you receive if you'd like to be added to that waiting list. Um, so we have a couple of questions in the Q&A and I received a couple in the um, in the registration. So I'm gonna start with the ones we received earlier. Um, so Laura, the first question we have was, um, what plants or trees would be appropriate planting in the fall rather than waiting until the spring to plant? Oh my gosh, I would fall is the best season for planting for almost everything because you um, plants kind of go uh, trees, their energy goes down into their roots. You know, they're not trying to push out new leaves and all of that. So, I think fall is is a great time to plant, and um, and then you have the benefit of the rains. Um, you know, eight months of rain, you don't have to worry about watering. Excuse me. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. No, I we always encourage folks to consider planting in the fall rather than in the spring, um, especially when it comes to native trees and shrubs. Um, and that's pretty much across the board, whether it's an ornamental or a native species. Um, planting in the fall, especially when it's um, a larger uh, plant is always better. So it, it really allows those plants to get their roots established in the fall um, when they're not trying to have their above ground growth. So pretty much every every native tree or every tree or shrub is better to plant in the fall. Uh, our next question is, uh, and you touched a little bit on this um, mm -hmm. earlier in the presentation, but I'll still ask. Um, what's the best way to prepare ground for nature scaping? Well, it depends on what the condition of your ground is to begin with. Some people may have really compacted urban soils. Other folks may have um, field grasses and that actually underneath there's a lot of organic matter and a pretty good soil. So you want to examine what you have. <laughs> I'm so sorry for my cough. It's okay. I'm trying to get through. Uh, maybe it'll come back. And especially if you have want to do a rain garden, one of the things, and we'll talk about this in, the, in that site design, is do a soil percolation test to see how well the soil, the soil that you have drains. Uh, but as I mentioned, I think many times over, in almost all cases, 
if you dig into your soil and it's really hard to dig into and it looks like it's just all mineral with no organic matter in it and, or you see no you know no soil life in it then you really want to be mixing some compost in with that soil to create a better structure and the nutrients and the soil life you know as a, and and even if you don't do it broadly across your whole yard um, or broadly across the whole planting bed area at the very least you want to when you're big digging holes to plant the plants the shrubs or whatever the tree you want to dig that hole at least twice as big if not a little more as the size of the container of the plant that you're putting in there and and that's a, a good opportunity to blend the compost with the native soil when you plant some yeah no it's those that's some great um preparation advice and and really, you know, site prep is one of the most important things you can do in a naturescaping project. So really good site prep will set you up for a, a really um, a good start in the, the long run. Um, another question we received earlier, um, and I don't know about this, so I'm, I'm curious myself. So this person is wondering if there is a list of Willamette Valley or Oregon native plants that are low on pollen for an urban garden that's cared for and visited by people who have seasonal allergies. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's, that's an a good one. It's an interesting yeah. question. Um, man, there should be an allergy list. Because mm -hmm. I'm thinking like, I know, you know, my mom always had really bad allergies and she, hay fever called it. And it's, you know, and there's certain plants. I think that the plants that are pollinated by wind are the worst. Right, okay. like golden rod, probably be yeah. one. But then there's other plants, like we looked at those ones that have, you know, the tubes and they're the, you know, tubular flowers, and that, um, you know, that isn't going to be dispersing pollen. But one thing I learned because I was I joined the urban beekeepers for a while and went to their monthly meetings, and they do reports of what you know. Uh, what pollen was you know highest every month and it it really you know people think about the flowers but really it's the trees <laughs> and they're at a scale where you know even if you don't have them in your yard they're going to be they could have a big effect on you so um i think that takes a deeper dive than i can answer here but um yeah, I um I just don't have real specifics for you because it's it's almost like well, it can't be a panacea if you want pollen for the bees. <laughs> you can't have a plant without pollen. And so, but then you have the allergy thing, but I think there I think with some research could come up with a list of the the ones that least impact people and are beneficial to the bees. I like that question. Yeah, it's a really great question. And and like I, I mentioned, I, I I have not heard, but I, I do like your reasoning of plants that get often pollinated by the wind seem like they, mm -hmm. they would cause more allergies. So yeah, um, I think I think you're onto something there. And conifers mm -hmm. I have this Lebanon cedar, and my whole driveway is just covered with yellow pollen. Yep. Bingo. Certain times Bingo. Of year. Makes sense. Um all right, the last of the questions we received earlier but before the presentation. Um, do you have any best advice for keeping um blackberry, keeping a yard blackberry and ivy free? Mm. Well, um always it seems that um when removing invasives, you just kind of have to bite the bullet in the beginning. <laughs> to knock them back and get them to a, a, a place where they you can manage easily or more easily ongoing. And um, I mean, I've worked with restoration crews with blackberries, you know, we, we just take it to kind of grubbing out those roots. You know, you do it once, that way you kind of do it once and for all. Um, if you can really um, cut them back and then dig out the the you know the root base of the blackberries and um you know if a little little 
ceiling pops up here or there, that's nothing to deal with. A lot of people, the problem is, is their neighbors, you know, are continual <laughs> gifts that keep giving, you know, that they have to contend with. And I, I don't envy that situation. With the ivy, the most important thing to remember is don't, you know, remove anything that's beginning to climb up a tree trunk. Um, it's the vertical vines that flower and seed, and then those spread even more wildly. And if you can even just, you know, like kind of, they talk about like at chest height, cut those vines. And you could, depending on how advanced they are, I mean, you might be able to, if it's uh, not just beginning, you can pull them off the trunk of the trees. They might be so enmeshed that you don't want to be pulling bark off, you know, but there is a no Ivy league that you could refer to. And I know with your twit, um, you know, East Multnomah soil and water conservation district does offer, I believe a workshop just on all the invasive weeds and how to remove them very specifically. And I imagine what, what do you have for that? Yeah. So Twitter we have program. a couple, yeah, we have a couple of um, resources um, that I can point out. So we have on our website, a weed and pest directory that goes through many, um, many of, you know, both non-native weeds as well as invasive species and offers tips on, on treatment and control. Um, so I would refer folks to that and I will include a link to that in our follow-up email. Mm -hmm. And not to mention, we also have our weed wrangling workshop, um, which is a webinar just like this okay. one. That will be held on November the 14th, um, where we'll actually be doing a deep dive into how to get a handle on many of these common species like blackberry and, and like ivy. Um, so I would definitely recommend um, signing up for that workshop and we'll actually take, take folks through a step-by-step -step process on how they can get a handle on plants just like ivy. Um, I think ivy is, is one that we're going to be making sure to include. So um, I'll also include a link to, to sign up for that workshop in that follow-up email that I've, I've mentioned a couple of times now. Um, so yeah, so moving over into questions that we received this evening. Um, so it looks like we had a couple questions about site prep. So I'll um, kind of stick with the theme there. So what is the best way to amend very hard clay soil so that it can increase its water holding capacity? Well, I, again, I, um, I, my own yard, which I moved to three years or four years ago, was just rock and clay on a slope and I couldn't even get a shovel in. Mm -hmm. And after three years of laying down mulch, I built some nice hummusy soil on top of it all and it seems to have changed the texture beneath um so let's see am I answering the question or not I, I've got a little distracted. Um, so I guess I guess the question is like what was the process that you took to amend your soil mm. <laughs> well I'm blending compost in each hole that I create with the native soil, number one, and then the mulching that I'm doing on top is also improving the soil. So it's a combination of the two. Essentially, Which, it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's just a practice that I do pretty regularly. So it sounds like a lot of, a lot of elbow grease and mixing both kind of you know, native soil and amendments and doing that in your planting holes is, is kind yeah. of what, what you had, yeah. had done. Mm -hmm. um, which brings us to our next question, which is what do you recommend to amend clay soil with? Is there like a particular product that you've used in the past um, that you have found really, really helpful to, um, to, to use for amendments? Well, I typically, um, you know, again, it kind of depends on the, the size that you're, of your yard that you're talking about. I mean, you can buy bags of compost at your local nurseries, um, but that adds up really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the benefit of it is, is that, you know, it's something you can put in the back of your car and, and uh, um, you know, if you don't have a truck, but um, 
but I really like to go to the places, the landscape supply places where they can dump a, a yard into a truck. Or in my case, I've, you know, had it delivered. But then you want to, you know, it's ideally you'd want to order enough, you know, like three cubic yards if, to spread over your um, and blend in with your, you know, your soils uh, in a given area. So, um, you know, maybe if you have a friend that has a little trailer or truck, you can get a cubic yard at a time. But it's, you know, buying it that way is... Um, I, I think I've calculated. It's like if you took those two cubic feet of compost bags times, say, 12, uh, <laughs> you know, you're talking. It adds up. Yeah. Yeah. It adds up to hundreds of dollars or $150 opposed to 20, 35 maybe for a cubic yard of compost um, in bulk. So that really is the way to go if you can. And if you can't get it all spread right away, you know, you're going to have a little pile in your driveway somewhere covered with a tarp. And and just to add to that, <laughs> um, maybe this is a place to mention um, chip drop, which is the mulch. It's the arbor chips. If, if you don't already know about it, um, all of our arborists are generating um, just truckloads of arbor chips and they they have to pay to to dump that so chipdrop.org was created to kind of match arborists with homeowners that would like some chips to lay down as a mulch and so I use that surface service uh, myself there's a lot of caveats to that again you the biggest one is like it's going to be a truckload you're going to have a big pile of mulch sitting there. It's like maybe you live in a neighborhood where, you know, a couple of neighbors also want some and you, but you want to have a place to dump it that um, they can get to. It's, it's virtually free. Um, or if you throw in a little $20 donation, you might get better, quicker service. Um, but um, I swear by it. In fact, I've listened to a lecture from a PhD scientist who actually researched different, all the different um, mulches on the market. And she said that these, these um, arbor chips are the best and the most effective. And I'm um, mostly because the others, when they get the finer you get with mulch, like dustier, it actually becomes a barrier and you don't have the same sort of air and gas exchange between soil and air that you want to have. And I maintain, um, at least my philosophy is that when you get the bark chips, it's it's all still living, correct? It's probably full of microbial activity. Whereas the, the um, mulches that you buy, I mean, that's yard debris that's been composted and to the point where it needs to reach these really high temperatures to kill weed seeds and pathogens. But at the same time, it's killing all the beneficial microbial life as well. So I feel when I'm putting bark chips down, I'm getting that benefit too. And, and because the pieces are a little bit bigger, um, like I have a steep slope of about 25% and that I covered, it, it it didn't slough at all in the winter time. Whereas the year before, when I bought the house, they had thrown, you know, blown this red bark in, and it was all down at the bottom of the hill in the winter time. So, just a few suggestions on mulch sources. Absolutely. Um, and a question just came in about chip drop. Um, wondering about how can you ensure they're not disease trips. Um, that is one of the caveats with chip drop is they typically just get whatever you can. Um, you can put in, um, you know, requests for the type of chips that you can receive and make requests that, you know, the trees are of, of a healthy variety, but that oftentimes does, um, does add to the wait time in receiving your chip drop. So, um, it is a wonderful service, but oftentimes you have to work kind of within the parameter of, of arborists. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. I mean, it is a good concern, but I also don't know how much of a concern it really is mm -hmm. you know, with all the trees that they're cutting. Gosh, after the windstorm, there was so many. The one thing I want, I forgot to mention earlier with that, if you're looking for mulch that's going to 
basically decompose faster. Then you want to order from chip drop, say in the summertime where you're getting both wood and leaves. That gives you the browns and the greens, just like what you want in your compost pile to have a really effective, quicker breaking down in, uh, into compost. So just something okay. to think about. Yeah, and I know I wrote this answer out, but I'll say it verbally as well. I believe that I recently received an email from Chip Drop saying um, now is a great time to order that this is entering into their off season. So um, if you are considering Chip Drop and you have room for it in particular, because as Laura mentioned, it is literally a truckload that comes. Um, now is a good time to, to place those order orders for those chips that you can use. Um, and a great thing too is if you are, if you do have other neighbors that are around that can use those chips, oftentimes it's a nice kind of community activity that you can build um, to have everyone bring out your wheelbarrows. We're going to move them over to, to my house today. We're going to move them over to your house tomorrow. And it you'll be surprised how quickly that, that pile will go down. Yeah. Um, all right. So another question that we had um, it, the slide regarding impervious surfaces, um, it would be interesting to see um, what is the difference with um, infiltration rate between lawns and plants, um, and that isn't lawn semi-impervious. Um, I guess the question is like, is lawn semi-impervious? It is. Um, you know, obviously uh, a lawn is better than say, you know, an impervious surface. And, and one could say it's even maybe better than a pervious surface, but we do need pervious surfaces for our vehicles and walkways. People don't always want to walk through a wet lawn or a lawn. Well, lawns get compacted too, where, you know, so wherever you're thinking of circulation, you want some kind of pavement. And, um, and I've actually, I don't have it at the top of my head, but I've seen how, um, lawns can be how ineffective there still can be rainwater runoff across a lawn especially if it's somewhat sloped it doesn't it doesn't infiltrate as nicely as it would in a planting bed because it's more compacted and um and so not to say that it's bad it's mostly bad for other reasons or discouraged i should say um because it's high inputs, you know, it's like you look at how so many people maintain their lawn and, and maybe it's not you all, but, you know, uh, there's the, the weed and the feed and the, um, and the mowing and, you know, lawnmowers. Fortunately, we moved along. I mean, there's more gas uh, lawnmowers, I think, are going to the wayside, but they're very big polluters. And all of the, you know, anything that all the stuff that people put in their lawns for, quote, fertilizing or, or pet, you know, herbicide or pesticide, all of that ends up in the water, you know, waterways. And it's, you know, and it gets to be high maintenance as well. So it's high input, low benefit, low benefit habitat wise. You know, that's, you know, those are the reasons we look to alternatives for lawn. But, you know, your point is right. It is, um, I think that's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Well, no, you're really agreeing that lawn versus plants, a planting bed is going to absorb water much more effectively than a lawn. Yeah. I think we're and just, it's it's gonna have deeper roots. So that water is gonna yes. go further down in, you know? That's, mm -hmm. that's oftentimes what helps with that water retention. Yeah. Um, another question we had is, where do you recommend buying native plants? Well, um, I, you know, I've been um, teaching and involved with native landscaping for close to 20 years now. And uh, it's really exciting to see how many nurseries have, you know, good native plant sections. And there's a lot of native plants, exclusively native plant nurseries out there. Some are strictly um, wholesale, but there's also many that are, um, open to um, to uh, not professional, you know, um, buyers as well. And I know that um, there's several kind of organizations, nonprofits that hold spring plant sales, backyard habitat, um, 
offers discounts on native plants and there's Sparrowhawk that's a kind of an online ordering of native plants. East Multnomah will bring back their annual native plant sale, East Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District. So you can check their website for that. Um, do you have any, I know that uh, there are handouts that talk about native plant sources. Do you have a link to something like that? So we don't have one ourselves, but we often refer people to the Backyard Habitat Program. Um, they actually have a web page that um, highlights um, nurseries throughout the Portland metro area that carries native plants. And so I'll, I'll include a link to that resource right. um, for folks to, to be able to explore um, just because it changes so often. So what we've found is if we print mm -hmm. something, it's out of date by the moment that we print it. And so Backyard Habitat has been has an amazing resource that really um, shows folks um, where those those nurseries are, and then also highlights those seasonal sales that you had mentioned. Wonderful. What else do we have here? Let's see. Um, another question is, this person has a riparian zone that goes dry in the summer, um, so it's difficult to main pl maintain plantings that get washed out in the winter and then dries up in the summer. Um, they're wondering what the what is the best way to get professional help? I can take this one if you like. Yeah. Well, the first thing that comes to mind, not about professional help, but if is if it's a sort of a flooding zone or a zone that uh, is underwater, willow stakes mm -hmm. and red twig dogwood stakes is a great way. You just get the branches that are about pencil width diameter and like a couple feet or so and stick them into a ground foot and they will root from those um, stems or branches. And uh, it's it's a very common practice done in larger scale restorations. But um, yeah, do you wanna add to that? Yeah, no, absolutely I can. Um, so we ourselves, as well as Backyard Habitat, have a, um, a contractor's or a professional's directory. Um, so I can include a link to that as well. So th those are organizations that specifically work in the Portland area or in Washington County, that can be your professional help. The other thing I would recommend is reach out to your conservation district. Um, I, the person who left this question didn't leave their name, but if you wanna reach out to me directly, I'm more than happy to put you in contact either with, with our urban conservation specialists who work in Washington County, or I can help you find your local conservation district so that you can reach out to them and, and see if they can come out and, and offer some technical assistance for, for you so that you can get you on on the right path to helping um helping alleviate that that uh that situation that you're dealing with. Right. Well, I'm seeing there's still many questions, but a lot of them say type answer, so you know, here we are at 7:30. I didn't know if you wanted to hand keep going or Yeah, let me just check take to look to see if there's anything that's really stands out. So let's do one more um, and then we'll call it for the night. Um, so mostly because this is talking about sheet mulching. So I think it'd be good to touch base on. So um, they are asking about with sheet mulching, if they, what well, would, would it be okay to skip that cardboard layer um, and just start with a very thick layer of wood chips instead? Or do you want to make sure to have that cardboard layer there? Um. No, I, this is uh, the latest research says you don't need to have the cardboard. In fact, it might even be a bit of a hindrance, but caveat is that you want to have the, the wood chips thick enough to kill whatever is underneath. Yep, absolutely. And it looks like that will um, kind of get us to the end of our questions for tonight. So Laura, I want to Thank you again for joining us um, and presenting tonight. Um, I always learn new things whenever I hear hear your presentation. So um, I always pick up something new for myself. So um, I will also send out that follow-up email to everyone who has joined us. Um, so look for that in by the end of the week, most likely. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to, to follow up with me. And I'm, I'm more than happy to touch base with Laura as well. Thank you all. Thank you all.